We're going to do a version of, uh, of a piece for you, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards and a few questions. But I'm going to cede the floor right now to my friend Sarah Lewis. Great. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. <sighs> it's such an honor and a privilege to be here and to salute a, a woman who my colleagues and I call often the oracle <laughs> <laughs> in Carrie Mae Weems. In 2005, I had the, the privilege to be able to, to salute her in a, in a meaningful way. I received a call in July of that year, and I was standing in, of all places, the Museum of the Confederacy hmm. in Richmond, Virginia. I was doing research. I just began teaching at Harvard, and I received a call from the head of the Spoleto Festival asking if I might identify an artist who they could commission to create a piece about grace in the face of tragedy. Hmm. Dylan Roof had just killed nine members of the Emanuel Baptist Church, an Amy Church, and he wondered how we might honor their lives. He asked me to take some time to consider it, and I, I needed no time at all. I knew immediately that Carrie Mae Weems was the artist for this project. I knew that, as she told me, when she heard President Barack Obama sing Amazing Grace at the end of his eulogy for Reverend Clementa Pickney that had prompted a question that created the foundations of this performance that you'll hear today. What is the role of grace in the pursuit of democracy? Grace, that radical call to deepen our humanity, can challenge us to act where we may have been complacent, to unveil what we might prefer to let remain unseen. Yet what this piece asks is, when can grace become more than a gesture? but a conceptual framework, even a moral code, and a way to move forward. It is an exemplary piece, I believe, of representational justice. Thank you for coming. So I made this piece, Grace Notes, Reflections for Now. And, um, um, you know, one of the things that I've come to completely understand and realize is that you do absolutely nothing without the kindness of your friends, the people who mm. care about you. Um, Sarah helped me to sort of make a shift that I needed to make in my work and thinking about levels of performance, music, lyrics, text, mm. dance, interested in these forms for a really long time, and it was through Grace Notes that I was able to bring a lot of it together. Grace Notes, and a variation of it, past tense, is going to be touring this year, uh, starting actually in, in, um, in January of next year, 2019. I can't believe how time is moving, time is flowing. But I wanted to say just something else. Um, I have uh, in this audience some extraordinary friends. Hmm. Eric, Hank Willis Thomas. One of the things that I've come to understand is that I really don't do this work really because I want to. I don't really sort of deal with the history of violence constantly because I want to, hmm. but really because I am compelled to, that my background, my, my culture, my concerns along with my, my skin, the way in which I've been marked by time forces me in some ways to do so. And so I think probably like my dear friend Hank, who is doing I think another really important project looking at the ideas of freedom and democracy for freedoms. It's work that we are compelled to do, that we think of ourselves uh, as artists who have social responsibility, and we come from a long line of artists who have felt very much the same way. Whether we're talking about Rick Lowe, the brilliant Rick Lowe and his project, Row House, the Astrogates and his extraordinary project in Chicago, 
Amaya Mesa Baines on the West Coast and the work that she's been doing with Latinas and Latinos and farm workers, important work. Suzanne Lacey also on the East Coast. There is a great tradition mm -hmm. of artists involved in activism. And so what we're going to do is we're going to share just one small piece of our project, um, Past Tense, with you that comes out of the larger project, Grace Notes, Reflections, for now. It's not always the easiest material to look at, the easiest material to deal with, or the easiest material to witness. OK, and we begin. A woman stands in the thaw of winter, the beginning of spring, reflecting, considering, imagining, contemplating the past, and imagining the future. Mm. With one step, she could be in the future in an instant, or in the past, or in the moment, the now. But to get to now, to this moment, she needs to look back over the landscape of memory. Lost in memory, the woman faces history, a history with the story that's been told a thousand times before. But if you look on the horizon, here and there, first seen, now hidden, are little sightings of hopes, of dreams, of memories. And if you look closely, through the corridors of time, even within the horror, one could see the fluttering wings of doves. Wings like time batting out beats of hope. Hope was the thing missed, the thing hoped for. Mm. You could almost taste it, but it was just out of reach, just above your head. Day by day, the country was slowly, persistently changing. Traditions were dying, forces colliding, and demographic shifting. The evidence, along with the anger, was everywhere. The resistance was so strong you could taste it. Tongues were wagging. Fingers were pointing to here, there, and everywhere. Blaming you, blaming them, blaming us. Dripped up by forces beyond their control, white men were disaffected and disenfranchised. Black men were disaffected and dying. But both, in the eyes of the state, are devoid of power. And yet, blinded by rage, race, and historical circumstance, each blamed the other. And I think that's an important idea. Blinded by rage and historical circumstance, each blamed the other. And so, we were no strangers to history. We walked onto history's stage, square-toed and flat-footed, unarmed and unprotected. And so imagine that you were always stopped, always charged, and always convicted. Imagine that you or your child was constantly living in a state of fear under constant pressure, constant suspicion, and troubled by this unrelenting history of violence, where time and time again, your encounter with those who are meant to serve ends in death. Imagine this, see this. Imagine the impossible. Imagine the worst of the worst and know that it's happening. Imagine Trayvon Martin or Michael Brown, only boys. Imagine Eric Gardner or Sandra Bland dying alone on a cold street for no apparent reason. Imagine the grief of their mothers, the suffering of their fathers, and the vengeful hearts of their sisters. Then imagine that for these crimes, no one is charged. No one is convicted. 
They were no strangers to sorrow. Time and time again, the man was rejected, and the woman was denied. A man was killed. The body lay in the open, uncovered and exposed. Women wailed. Men moaned. For reasons unknown. I saw him running. I saw him stop. I saw him turn with raised hands. I heard a shot. I saw him fall. For reasons unknown, I rejected my own knowledge and I deceived myself by refusing to believe that this was possible. So their rights were denied and people said little and did even less. This violence was not like in the movies. There were no fast cuts, no pans, zooms, no close-ups, no fades. Reality happens in slow motion and somber colors. So we ask this question. In this mystery of all mysteries, measure for measure, how do you measure a life? The man was rejected and the woman was denied. And the numbers tell the story. She was 25. He was 22. He was a father. She was 31. A man. He was 36. A brother. She was a mother. A boy. She was 28. A woman. An uncle. He was 25. A, a cousin. Sister. She was 34. A child. He was 43. Aunt. A friend. She was 37. A girl. He was 27. A father. She a was 35. Child. A brother. He was 18. A cousin. Aunt. He was 24. An uncle. He was 29. A, a husband. She was a 22. Sister. She was a woman. He was 41. A a mother. She was 23. An aunt. He was 36. A, a child. A, a girl. She was 24. A friend. He was 22. He was a father. She was 31. He was 36. A man. He was 28. A brother. A boy. He was 25. A cousin. A sister. She was 34. A friend. He a was 43. A father. She was 37. A boy. A brother. He was 27. A wife. A cousin. She was 35. She was a woman. He was a 18. A mother. He was 24. A brother. A sister. He was 29. Uncle. A child. Aunt. She was 22. A friend. He was cousin. 41. He was a father. She was 23. A man. He was 36. A, a brother. A sister. She was 25. A, boy. a girl. He was 22. An uncle. She Aunt, was 31. A cousin. He was 36. A child. He was a boy. 28. And the officer just shot him in his arm. We're waiting for a I will, sir. No worries. I will. He just shot his arm off. Call the doctor, please. Call him to get his hand off. He had you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Oh my God, please don't tell me he's dead. Please don't tell me my boyfriend just went like that. Yes, I will, sir. I'll keep my hands where they are. Please don't tell me this, Lord. Please, Jesus, don't tell me that he's gone. Please don't tell me that he's gone. Please, officer, don't tell me that you just did this. Imagine that you are always stopped always charged, always convicted. Imagine you or your child living in a state of constant fear, under constant pressure, constant suspicion, and troubled by this unrelenting history of violence, where time and time again, an encounter with those who are meant to serve ends with death. They were no strangers to sorrow. And time and time again, the man was rejected, the woman was denied. A man was killed, the body lie in the open, and exposed and uncovered, and women wailed and men mourned. For reasons unknown, 
I saw him running. I saw him stop. I saw him turn with raised hands. I heard a shot. I saw him fall. For reasons unknown, I rejected my own knowledge, and I deceived myself by refusing to believe that this was possible. So their rights were denied. And people said little and did even less. And this violence was not like it was in the movies. There were no fast cuts, no zooms, no pans, no close-ups, no fades. Reality happens in slow motion and in somber color. I saw him run. I saw him stop. I saw him turn with raised hands. I heard a shot. I saw him fall. For reasons unknown, I rejected my own knowledge, and I deceived myself by refusing to believe that any of this was possible. And so the people said little, and they did even less. In this... So, so in this mystery of all mysteries, this mystery of all mysteries, we do ask this question. We ask you to consider this. We ask you, how do you measure a life? And Sarah. In this mystery of all mysteries, in the Alpha and the Omega, on a day coming in a world without end, we humbly ask, how, by what means, by what measure, do you measure a life? Inch by inch, foot by foot, yard by yard, or step by step, by the moments lost or the moments gained, day by day, year by year, by yesterday, today, or tomorrow, by the miles walked, the mountains climbed, or the valleys explored, how do you measure a life? Do you measure it by the dreams imagined or by the hopes dashed? by the wisdom of wise words spoken, or by the sorrow suffered in silence, by the wealth accumulated, or by the amount spent, by success or over failure, by the monuments built, the walls scaled, or by defeats or victories, large or small, by the forgotten or over the remembered, by race, by class, by beauty, or by your lover's love, your hater's hate. By pushing against the wind, against the tide, against family, friend, tradition, how? Hmm. By the suffering of friends and your enemies alike, do you consider? Or by the beginning or by the end? by the way you confront life, or by the way you confront death, by the number of friends gathered during a lifetime, or by the remaining few who stand with you at the bitter end, shedding copious tears when they lay your body down, by the road traveled, or by the effort the drive, the sheer determination to endure all of the impossible, or by the kindness and the grace displayed in the process of living your life to the bitter end. How do you measure a life?
So we're going to have a bit of a discussion now. So we're going to set up a few chairs, and then we'll have a discussion. And if there's time, we'll do a little Q&A as well with you. We hope you can participate in. So while they're setting up, I'm just going to tell you a quick story. I mean, it's really true that for the most part, I would rather be shoe shopping than anything. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, this material is so difficult and so hard and so difficult for me to just deal with. But we started, started this idea with this question of this, um, the personal and the, and the political. And for me, there is no difference in my life between the personal and political. It all blends. It's all the, the thing. And that, you know, I do the work not because somebody is paying me to do it. I'm not doing it because it's, you know, social justice is suddenly trending on social media. And there, you know, there's a whole bundle of money to be made out there, you know, if you have, like, the right hashtag. Right? You do it because the work really sort of impels me. And so I wanted to just quickly, 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 quickly tell you about this, this dream. Please sit down. This dream that I had. Which sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of exemplifies where I am. So Sarah and I started working on this project, you know, and, and, and I'm sort of a fanatic and I work constantly all the time. And uh, my husband is fly fishing. I have this like, you know, this whole new piece that I, that I do. It's called While You Were Fly Fishing, <laughs> you know? Like, you know, all my projects, all, you know, everything I do while, while my husband is fly fishing on the weekends. <clears throat> and so about a year ago or so, I had this like amazing dream, this incredible, incredible dream. And um, uh, it was like a hot August night, I remember that. And uh, I went to sleep and uh, I dreamt that there was um, this extraordinary tsunami that was coming. I just saw this massive, wall of water just rising up and threatening to just take us all. And I remember in my dream, I, you know, I, 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 I see this thing and I know that I have to like warn my friends that this huge thing is coming and it's about to swallow us and destroy us, overtaking the land. And I wanted to save myself, alert my friends, and I started running. And just as I began to run, I turned to my left, and there was Donald Trump leering at me. <laughs> Fabulous. And I ran past him, and I ran towards my friends, saying that this thing was coming, that we had to somehow protect ourselves in some way. And then I get to this point where um, there's this great ladder for those of you who know, it was Martin Puryear's great, 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 great ladder. And I saw all of my friends climbing this ladder. And as they climbed, they were singing, we're climbing Jacob's ladder. And not as a, not as a, a hymn, but as this like sort of extraordinary protest song. And uh, there was something that I knew that in some way, that a part of the, the work had to do with trying to figure out how to get to higher ground. How to get to higher ground. And how to see what this moment is, how to analyze it, how to think about it, how to talk about it, um, how to negotiate it, how to deal with it, and of course, how to write about it, and then how to make work out of it. That's my, that's my project, and so for me, the political is personal, and the personal is always political. And so we'll start talking. And so. Oh, I'm sure. So first of all, Carrie, thank you so much for so many aspects of what we just went through here. First of all, for coming here and sharing your, your practice with us. Second of all, on a personal level to participate in it. An enormous amount, it was a tremendous surprise uh, to have that opportunity. Working with you over the last two days and in the weeks leading up to this more uh, online and discussion on the phone, 
I felt like this process is uh, something I was discussing earlier with our mutual friend Eric, is an iterative process that we continually reassess. And even right to the moment on the stage, we were reassessing and you were guiding us forward. How do you perceive, is, does a work ever finish for you? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> No, no. I mean, you're always editing. You're always, you know, I think as long as you're sort of alive in a way, you know, and you care, you're always at it. And uh, I don't think I've ever seen anything that I've ever written that I thought was done. You know, or a photo, you know, or, or a project that I've mounted that I thought was really finished. On occasion, yes. I mean, you know, but, 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 but essentially, I think you're always mining because we're growing, we're growing, we're changing, we're... We're grappling, we're always grappling with the idea. You know, in, for instance, in this sort of question of grace, what is it? I mean, you know, it took me, you know, like the, the, the title was Grace Notes, Reflections for Now, and yet it took me a year and a half after the project was mounted to really, really sort of nail down in some small way uh, the meaning of grace for the project and for, my, and for myself. As an, as an example. So what I, I was going to suggest is I'm going to ask one more question I have on my mind, and then I think I'll pass to Sarah. Maybe we can all uh, collectively you know, uh, find ways to share her uh, genius. How did that sound? So I'm going to build off of something Sarah said earlier, that you are known as the oracle. And that pressure of sorts must be, uh, is that a, is it, does it feel like a pressure to be an no, oracle? Oh, I don't I mean, even believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. I have so much of this stuff I'm doing. But I'm glad they think so. This is very useful that other people think that this is true. It's a useful right? tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, really, actually, one of, one of, the, one of the sort of uh, wonderful moments of like being sort of like recognized in the world, I walked into Neiman Marcus to buy a jacket on sale. And I took it up to the counter, and the salesperson took my credit card, and she said, oh my god, you're carrying me wings. I can give you a 20% discount. <laughs> I knew at that moment that I had arrived. That makes it worthwhile. <laughs> OK, Sarah. Oh, um, thank you, thank you, thank you again for the opportunity to be part of the piece that, I, as I mentioned, when I was standing there in that sweltering July day, I knew it could only come from you. It is modular, this piece does shift as you consider your audiences, right? <sighs> One of the things that I most ad admire about your work, and I teach at Harvard, but I came to know Carrie's work when I was curating at, at MoMA and Tate Modern before that. I, I think I've, I've lived with her work really over half my life, really. Is to get us to do what I think the best artists get us to understand, which is to perceive what we don't know we don't know, but to feel it, you know, not, not as an intellectual idea, but to really feel it. In many ways, as you know, I think you're so much of what Frederick Douglass hoped for when he considered who might come to consider how images would move us closer towards one another. I have so many questions for you, but in this context, I wonder I think we've inspired conversation. I guess this is what's happening behind us. I wonder how the tsunami that you describe in the dream, right? How you might articulate what, what this is, and if you could say have another commission, mm -hmm. what you might address. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think um, 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 how many artists are in the audience? So I get a sense of who I'm kind of talking to. So there, there, are, there, there are a number of artists that are in the audience, you know? It, it seems to me that, you know, that, that the, the work is, it's always the same. The work has been the same for years. The concerns have been the concerns from almost the very beginning. The thing that matters, I think, is that at any given moment, um, as you are shifting and developing and processing is how to enter the phase of your work at any given time that allows you to build on this sort of sustained dialogue that you are indeed having, not with an audience, but really with you. Right. 
right? right? With your life, with right. your life, and right. the, the meaning of your life and the way in which you decide to express that or the mm -hmm. abilities that you might have to express that in the thing that actually gets made. Yeah. And so, um, and so um, I have been completely, completely for years, really buried in this, snaking through these ideas about power and structures of power. Um, and right now I'm looking at that in relationship to structures of violence. And so whether or not I decide to do a project that's focused specifically, an art project that is uh, specifically spo uh, focused on violence like, like Grace Notes, like Past Tense, like uh, this uh, um, um, uh, From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried, which is another kind of violence, uh, or, or this sort of piece that we've just presented, which is uh, very, very difficult to, to look at and to see. Um, or to do convenings where I'm bringing together lots of other artists to sort of think through these ideas along with me, artists and writers and curators and dancers and musicians who are interested in sort of s similar territories. It's all a process, it's all a part, interconnected, a way of working and a way of realizing and seeing the world and understanding your place in it and what you have to voice and what you have to voice. And the thing that I think we have that is really extraordinary and important is that we have platform. Mm -hmm. We have platform. Mm -hmm. And given this platform, then what do you do with this platform? Well, I could show just uh, slides, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or I can really sort of talk about the issues that I think are much larger than myself, which is usually what I'm uh, generally more interested in, as much as I'm, of course, completely concerned with my own artistic production, I am interested in uh, how that connects with other artists. I'm always interested in the notion of collaboration, even as much as I'm interested in directing all of those collaborations, because I hate being told what to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, this is interesting because before we move forward, I think that there's something that's important about two things. One, that's the work that we are each doing um, because all of us, I think, in one way or another are involved in sort of these sort of questions about art and justice and art and social justice and art and vision, this sort of crucial moment and that we've been doing this work for a very long time. And so I'd actually like to ask you, Sarah, just a little bit to talk about the project that you're working on, the major convening that you have coming up, and to talk also with Damon in this sort of wonderful shift that's going on starting here and the way in which you've decided to sort of orchestrate this coming together, this sort of particular art track that you've developed here and what that means for you and then for Tanya to talk about the work that she's doing as well. Okay. Would you like to start? So, okay. Well, I think you, you can hear a bit about why at least my students and my friends know that Carrie's the Oracle, even if she's not going to claim <laughs> this, this title. I think that uh, one of the reasons why is there's a, there's a sense of gathering us around the central urgent questions of the day. One of the questions that we share in common and that animates my work right now is the considering the role of the arts for expanding our notion of who counts and who belongs in society. As a historian, I, I'm looking at this both through publications and through a convening and in a media project that will, will come to light soon. Uh, this question from the vantage point of the last three centuries, really. If you take the idea of citizenship in the United States as um, defined in 1790 as being white and being male and being able to hold property, how have we arrived at our current definition today? Is that journey just a legal narrative or is it also a cultural one? And I think you know what my answer is. And the work, both in the classroom, I teach a course at Harvard, which is now one of the required classes and part of the core curriculum, it's a large class. Thank you. Yeah, that's, a Vision and Justice, the same name as the publication that I guess edited for Aperture in 2016, um, has as its core question. It's structured around the answer being delivered in a set of episodic case studies, right? 
How is this, how is this question function when you look at emancipation and slavery? What is the role of, of images as the kind of data to both as a weapon, to both denigrate human life, which it did, to reify racial hierarchies, which it did, and then to liberate us from that notion of it uh, in the century that, to come? How is this function for indigenous identities? How is this functioned in the context of Japanese internment? How is this function for white Americans through thinking about immigration? Who can come through Ellis Island? Who can't? Oh, no, no, not Southern Europeans, but oh, Northern, okay. But images constituted the kind of rationale for this. So the work that I began with Aperture has extended into the classroom at Harvard and will, um, in 19, have another life as a convening, which will be almost inconceivably a two-day conference. It really should be a week-long, month-long conference <laughs> in which we consider the questions uh, that have come out of this, this sort of central one. A radial set of speakers, artists, public servants, uh, public intellectuals, academics of all kinds. We will open, I don't need to tell you who we're going to open with, you can imagine. Carrie Mae Weems, certainly, and conclude with Brian Stevenson, and have many of my, my colleagues throughout, Hank Willis Thomas, who's here, Deborah Willis, Ava DuVernay, who was here, could not have this without Damien Wotzel and, and Tanya. And this will happen in, um, at Harvard. Well, April 25th and 26th will be deeply public facing and in ways that, which will have both it being live streamed but deployed after the fact as well. So this really, this work which has historical roots in, in Douglas's scholarship, Frederick Douglass's scholarship, is the stuff of, of my life. I think I'll be doing it for the decades to come. This but, is very exciting. <laughs> yeah. This is very exciting. You know, I was thinking about this yesterday, really thinking about this idea about optics. Oh, the mic, sorry. About, about, about optics. optics. You know, in this idea, very early on, his sort of extraordinary idea about optics and fashioning his own sense of representation. I mean, this is really sort of an extraordinary idea for 1850, blah, 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 blah. right? Really sort of extraordinary. But um, Tanya. Oh, I, um, I'm just so grateful to be in the presence of artists who are willing to dig deep and do the hard work of dwelling on the darkness and presenting it in a way so that we listen and are moved and are sparked to take action. This is, um, so I'm so grateful to Carrie and I'm so grateful to Hank and Eric and Paula here and to Sarah who blew my mind yesterday with her presentation. How many of you saw her talk? Brilliant, right? I'm still shaken by it. Yeah. And yeah. what shook me so much, like I feel like, this is my first Aspen Ideas Festival and I'm having a fabulous time. <laughs> um, and I feel like it's not just because of all the ideas that we are like, so saturated with around us, but also by the associations and connections that we're able to make because of the ideas that are being presented to us. And that, that happened very palpably yesterday in your talk when you showed those pictures of the internment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you saw that Japanese businessman with the tag when he was being taken away. And I could not get the images of the kids in Tornia out of my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, we are doing it again and we're doing it again. And that's why we need artists like, like all of you to really speak our truths and to speak truth to power and to make us realize that we can't fuck up again. You know, one of the um, things that I think is really important though, Tanya, is that sort of the, the, the production that you do in the, in, the, in the ways, in the extraordinary ways that you've worked with artists time and time and time again. And I'm one of those artists that, that, that you know, I, that, that can thank you, that you've as assisted me in producing any number of my projects over the years. For 10 years now. For, for 10 years now. But you've also worked with any number of other really important artists. And so a part of your role is to act really as sort of a conduit and a producer to many of the ideas that you are interested in through your own practice and being a co-founder of federations. Yeah? I think she's trying to get me to talk about myself. Um, Can't help. You can go to my website, tanyaturnsup.com. It's all there. Um, don't Google my name. <laughs> <laughs> don't Google my name. But um, go to my website, tanyaturnsup.com. Um, okay. But yes, the, the Federation, it's a coalition of artists, organizations, and allies that are committed to keeping cultural borders open, which Carrie is a part of. Hank and Eric, Four Freedoms is a part of. And we have a very um, simple aim, which is to show that art is essential to democracy and that art unites us. And you can find more information at wearethefederation.org. 
Um, and it was co-founded by myself with the artist Laurie Anderson and the producer Laura Mikkelshishan. And uh, we are um, surrounded by amazing participants like PEN America, Spotify, Tumblr, the Public Theater, New York Live Arts, Brooklyn Public Library, and we are continuing to add participants. So that's what Carrie's referring to. But my great joy throughout the last 23 years of my life has been to be surrounded by artists who inspire me and who make me think and who really are holding up a mirror to this world and questioning our democracy. And that's why I work with them. So I, I'm the lucky one. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. I'm just not going to, again, not dwell certainly on myself, but I will say the, the honor of having the three of you here is indicative of the idea that this has a place in the larger discussion. And that's been, for me, the, the, the mission of trying to bring the arts into larger conversations, whether here at a place like Ideas Festival, where uh, there are all manner of ideas and sectors being discussed, but as Sarah said, I'm, I'm with you. It is not simply a legal transition, it is a cultural transition that we all go through as people. So it is necessary to take stock of that in the larger context. Uh, in particular, in this year, uh, a track labeled The Art of Justice, which leaves open a lot of, a lot of uh, room, everything from, uh, you know, and very much inspired by your work, Sarah, uh, which has opened up so many uh, doors to my perception. Uh, but, you know, also Ava DuVernay and her work, which has literally trans is transforming the, the work against mass incarceration through Aggie Gunn's fund, Art for Justice fund, and all of the things that are peeling off of cultural activities to uh, Jose Antonio Vargas, who will be here tomorrow talking about his upcoming, uh, his uh, memoir, which is about to come out, Notes of an Undocumented Citizen, and how the art of memoir actually is the, the legacy of a person, an actual individual. It is not a concept, it is a person. And how that is, the, the art in that is what will last and go on. And I could keep going, but all of the people assembled here uh, fulfill that role of expanding the conversation and overlapping. And the one thing I'd say is that it's so important to do that overlapping work, and it is work because to stay in our lane is to be narrow and to take that next step. And so just my last note on that is that as I transition and I head to you know, my new role at Juilliard, I think of this as, uh, you know, it's like a, a kaleidoscope refracting. And now it's about taking the world to that, to, to the art, if you will. Whereas I was hoping to bring the art and cultural uh, viewpoints and overlapping sectors to, to a place like this, now it's about bringing the world to that focus of art. And you're training uh, the future. And then that's when then you get the future. But uh, it's just been an incredible honor to have you here, Carrie, to, to partake in this. And for all of you, uh, I think you saw something pretty remarkable. I mean, I've done some extraordinary things on this stage over many years, but nothing ever even remotely like this. Uh, when I think about, you know, it's a, it's a legacy. So thank you for that. We have time for literally uh, I have a question. I have a question, but you know what we're going to do? In the interest of this, the best way we can do this, let's take three questions, and then we'll somehow decide how to manage our time. So we have a, a microphone here, so a short, succinct question, and then we'll do one, two, and three. My short question is this. I, we, my wife and I were lucky enough to acquire at Anderson Ranch last year your, your photograph of Ella Fitzgerald, and every day I look at it, I'm filled with joy. And you're... Oh, it's fantastic. Just fantastic. Oh, that's so great. Can I come visit one day? I, absolutely. Anytime. We, we would love that. I and, have room and now on my you're wall. Up, obviously, you're confronting some of the real societal darkness that we're all facing. Do you, do you have a feeling that your, your own personal ode to joy is still in front of you? Okay. We're going to hold yes. that for a second. <laughs> that was a short answer, yes. Another question? People are not. We're going to end with an ode of oh, Paula right here. And then we'll come back to Ode to Joy. <laughs> Ode to Joy is one of my favorite songs, by the way. Do you know it? Don Cherry, Don Pullen. I listen to it every morning. Can you? Almost. Schiller's Ode to Joy, right? Fourth Movement, Ninth Symphony. Um, could you all share with us how creatives can lead the way. It is the time we have this huge vacuum. Um, how do you think creatives can be the most effective in doing so? 
I think that's that's probably a wonderful question to finish on. Maybe we could all take a little uh, a little take at it. But I think actually we should actually just try and defer our time to Carrie. Oh my God. Well, um, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Mike. But you know, I mean, it seems to me that um, we were talking a little bit about this yesterday. That there is this vast terrain, and everybody's looking at culture. Everybody. There are more art institutions, museums, fairs, festivals happening around the world related to art than ever before. Whether it's you know art and music, art and dance, art and poetry, right? I mean, cult, right? People are steeply interested in the world of culture, steeply. I think that there are a couple of things that you know that that that, that, that I'm interested in. I don't know what. I don't know what anybody else can do. I just know what I can do, you know? And that is to really sort of, you know, uh, mind my field in every conceivable way, whether I'm producing as an artist and making as an artist, whether I'm teaching, whether I'm guiding, whether I'm guiding my students, whether I'm guiding my students to ask certain kinds of questions, whether I'm asking certain kinds of questions of myself and of my public and of my audience, Right, and, 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 and it seems to me that one of the, 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 the things that's sort of most important is really in trying to figure out what are the right questions to be asked in relationship to cultural production and how we think about cultural production and its role in the dynamics of our lives. And so one of the things that I am really most interested in Beyond sort of, you know, my ideas about what I'm developing as an artist around these sort of issues of power and violence and blah, blah, blah. I'm really deeply interested in mining the field of the way in which contemporary artists, and in particular artists of color and women, have been um, amazing inventors in the field precisely because of who we are. We have actually opened up whole new pathways for understanding of ideas for what art is and how art can be articulated, explained, and used, and developed. This is amazing stuff, but nobody is actually talking about it. It's the one thing that I think that really, for me, from my vantage point, really needs to be talked about as we start to think about opening up the canon opening up ourselves, opening up our institutions to other ways of understanding what art is contemporarily. Art is changing, it's developing, it's growing, and, 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 and those people that are leading the way actually come out of uh, these cultures and uh, genders and bodies and skin types that are not unlike mine. Of course. Just to briefly add, the person who I feel sort of needs to be summoned here at the, at the end is, is Frederick Douglass, in part, to answer this question for a couple of reasons. Number one, I think he has offered a, a model for what Kerry has so masterfully done today, which is to bravely point to the arts at the time, in his context, during the Civil War, right, to think about how we might move forward. And what he offered as a, a short kind of answer to the question isn't that we so much just look to the work of masterful artists. He didn't name a single artist in the speech that he redrafted three times over the course of his life, despite the fact that he could have, right? Instead, he was thinking about how it is that any work of art that might impact you, say you buy Carrie's work and this is the work that you love, or Hank Willis Thomas's work, how that impacts you and to not let that private inner shift that occurs in you be underestimated as having enough coalescent force to then galvanize a movement, to, to move us forward. So I think the answer then lies with us as much as it does with the makers and the artists. And that's very much, I think, the, the power of his speech. No? You know? So, yeah. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the festival.